This is Biology Unit 2, Paper 2, June 2016. Keep Biology ASMR soft spoken. Let's go. Question 1 A. Figure 1 is an incomplete, detailed drawing of a section of a die cut leaf. Here we have two parts labeled. We have the epidermal cell, so that is the stop layer. And just to explain, the epidermal cell is at the top. This is the upper epidermis. And above this is the waxy cuticle to limit the loss of water. But the epidermal cell is different from some of the other cells in the leaf as it does not have chloroplasts. This allows it to be transparent, which facilitates the entry of sunlight. Down here, we have the spongy mesophyll cells. These are irregularly shaped and facilitate gaseous exchange. We can see that they have large air spaces because this would allow air and water vapor to diffuse in and out through the stomata or the guard cells. So part one saying, complete the drawing in figure two to accurately show the palisade cells and a vascular bundle. So this is the same drawing as above, but there has been a lot of stuff filled in here and labeled. But really, the only things that we have to fill in here are this layer here called the palisade mesophyll. And what is notable about this is that it is loaded with chloroplasts. So when sunlight enters through the upper epidermis, photosynthesis can occur at extremely high rates in the palisade mesophyll. The vascular bundle is going to be within the spongy mesophyll and that will be it labeled here and the vascular bundle I'll just label it as VB this contains the xylem and the phloem for water and sucrose transport respectively We've already done part two, which is to, identify, to describe the cells labeled one and two, which would have been the upper epidermis and the spongy mesophyll. Let's look at B. Figure two is a flowchart outlining how nitrogen is cycled in ecosystems. So here we can see a very complex diagram, basically showing how atmospheric nitrogen is converted to ammonia, nitrates, and finally can either leach into the soil, be taken up into plants, or be returned to the atmosphere or as nitro nitrogen gas. What the question is asking us to do is to label the parts X and Y. So just to briefly go through this, and I'll just trace the part of X. X is showing nitrogen gas converting into ammonia. Now this is done in the roots of plants and in the soil through nitrogen fixing bacteria. So this is called nitrogen fixation. Y is showing the conversion of ammonium to nitrate and this is done through nitrifying bacteria. For example, nitrobacter. So this is what we'll put for a response. Name the processes label X and Y and each and for each process give a brief description. Process X, nitrogen fixation, bacteria in the soil or root nodules, example rhizobium, converts atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia. Process Y is nitrification and bacteria in the soil, example nitrobacter or nitrifying bacteria convert ammonia in soil to nitrites and then into nitrates. You name each process and just give a basic description. That's four marks. Part two. With reference to figure two, comment on one major human activity which has had an impact on global nitrogen cycling. Well, the HEBA process, um, if you're familiar with that, Basically, this, without the use of bacteria, has enabled the synthetic fixation of nitrogen gas, typically to make fertilizers. Um, so this has allowed a higher amount of atmospheric nitrogen to be converted into ammonia. 
Of course, fertilizer can be used by farmers to grow leguminous plants and of course other types of plants. But leguminous plants in particular have a nitrogen fixing bacteria in their root nodules, which can further increase the rate of nitrogen fixation. This is just one example. Let's look at question two. A. Adult human hemoglobin samples are exposed to different concentrations or partial pressures of oxygen. So let me explain what this term partial pressure means. Now, when we have gas in the atmosphere that we breathe in, only a small percent of that is oxygen. Most of it is nitrogen, about 78% is nitrogen and 21% is oxygen. So they use the term partial pressure when talking about oxygen because it makes up only a part of the atmospheric gas. So the amount of oxygen that combines with each sample is expressed as the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen. So here we can see on the left column, partial pressures of oxygen measured in kilopascals goes from 0 to 14. And here we have saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen given as percentages. So let's take a look at this. What can we see here? Well, we can see that as the partial pressure of oxygen increases, so does the saturation of hemoglobin with the oxygen. However, it is not a linear relationship because we can see big jumps from 1 to 2 to 3 and the increases are only cumulative towards the end where it increases by only 2 at a time. So I said on the grid provided, plot a line graph of saturation of hemoglobin at various partial pressures of oxygen. This is what our graph is going to look like. And here we have at very low partial pressures, of course, the saturation of oxygen, hemoglobin with oxygen is zero, but it has an exponential increase at a point, but then it begins to plateau. There's a decreasing rate of increase until it plateaus where at very high partial pressures, not much, it doesn't get that much extra saturated with oxygen. The, the shape of this graph is described as S-shaped or sigmoidal. And just to give a brief explanation of what is happening here, this means that at high partial pressures, it becomes fully saturated with oxygen. So basically, where a lot of oxygen is coming into the body, where oxygen concentrations are high. So for example, this would be in the alveoli, in the lungs, where oxygen concentration or pressure is high, you will get the hemoglobin being very saturated with, with oxygen. But at lower points here, where the partial pressure is low, and this would be, for example, in um, Let's say, for example, muscle tissues, there will be low oxygen levels there. So what happens is that the hemoglobin is able to offload the oxygen into the muscle tissues. But the hemoglobin would not offload oxygen into the lungs, for example, where the pressure is already high. So they said with reference to the shape of the graph, describe observed changes in the uptake of oxygen by hemoglobin as the oxygen concentration increases. Well, we just said that the graph has a sigmoidal on S shape. This indicated that oxygen uptake increases slowly at first with increased partial pressure of oxygen, but then there's a much steeper increase from beginning to plateau. So at the end, where partial pressures are high, it begins to plateau. Part 3 is to comment on the significance of this response for oxygen transport in the body. Well, what was noted before is that hemoglobin absorbs oxygen in the lungs because the oxygen concentration is high in the lungs, partial pressure is high, such as in the alveoli, the air sacs. But it would release the oxygen where partial pressures are low where oxygen is needed, basically. So, for example, in, in respiring tissues, such as muscles. Let's look at B. Figure 3 is a photomicrograph of a section through the medulla of the kidney of a mammal. 
and there's three parts labeled and all they're asking us to do is to identify those three parts and we can see it here so a and b are both sections of the loop of henley and you can simply call them the tin section and the tick section now how you can actually tell the difference in this case is the thickness of the cells also we can see that the cells don't have a distinct border between them now let's look at as opposed to c which would be here this would be a collecting duct here would be a collecting duct as well and you can see that the nuclei just like here are present but the cell borders are quite distinct from what you can see another way how we can tell that this is the collecting duct is that the cells bulge towards the center part which is the lumen this is where the filtrate usually which would be urine would be passing through now why it bulges like this is because the collecting duct is usually filled with aquaporins which are water filled channels that you know facilitate osmosis because the collecting duct is used to transport urine to the ureters but it is also used to reabsorb water back into the bloodstream so that's why the cells sort of bulge towards the lumen to facilitate that let's look at part two outline the process of urea formation and suggest a reason why urea in the form of nitrogenous waste is produced in mammals so typically how urea is formed anytime you eat proteins proteins um, hydrolyze or broken down to form amino acids which is their monomer form their single unit form and those amino acids contain distinct groups connected to carbon there's a carboxyl group there's a hydrogen atom there's a residue group or an R group and finally there is an amino group if the amino group is removed that is called deamination so deamination this occurs in the liver to form ammonia now the amino group contains nitrogen and hydrogen so the nitrogen is being removed thus nitrogenous waste so the ammonia is then combined with carbon dioxide in the liver to form urea we must get rid of this urea because it, it can be toxic if left there for a long time so of course the reasons for converting ammonia to urea is because urea has a lower toxicity compared to ammonia ammonia is highly toxic so urea also requires less water for elimination via the urine than ammonia so once we have that explained we get four maps let's look at question three a table two is an incomplete comparison of humoral and cell mediated immunity complete table two by writing the answers in the relevant spaces so there are two types of immunity humoral immunity is a little more simple because basically what we have are b lymphocytes that are going to secrete antibodies in response to an antigen and those antibodies are basically the primary defense against any pathogens such as bacteria or viruses and their toxins coming into the bloodstream it is quite rapid and is usually like a more short-term effect gets rid of the pathogens quickly cell mediated immunity is a little more complicated these involve t lymphocytes or cytotoxic t cells um well, so what t lymphocytes do is that they would typically detect the antigens if they are presented to them so for example I'll give you an example when phagocytes engulf bacteria or macrophages engulf bacteria they absorb the antigens into their cytoplasm now what can happen is that they can grow little projections right or similar to dendrites so sometimes they're called dendritic cells and they can actually present these antigens they can put the antigen from you know from the pathogen they can put that um, at the end of each little finger like projection and the T cells would be able to see that it's kind of like a call for help 
right? He's like, I have a poison in me, look, it's here. And the T cell could recognize that and they can, through direct cell to cell contact, right, they can make the infected cell undergo lysis, which means splitting, which basically means it can induce death in the cell. Now, typically, this would be for tumor cells, intracellular pathogens, which means that pathogens that have invaded cells, they're not in the bloodstream really, but they've, they've invaded um, white blood cells or red blood cells, for example. And the onset of this is this, more delayed, it takes a longer time. Part two, explain why after a first infection with measles, a person is unlikely to be reinfected. Well, to answer this, we have to understand about immune responses. We know an unnatural active immunity. Basically, what we know is that when someone gets infected, they undergo a primary immune response. And during that primary immune response, memory cells are formed. While, you know, lymphocytes and white blood cells are trying to fight off the infection, they are also resulting in the stimulation and the formation of memory cells. So memory cells, let's say that the person gets reinfected, let's say that, um, and in this case here we talk about measles, so if the measles antigen comes into contact with the body again, memory cells would recognize the measles antigen, and then they would differentiate into B plasma cells and T cells to protect against reinfection. And just so you remember, remember B plasma cells secrete antibodies into the bloodstream while T cells undergo more direct cell to cell contact to cause cell death to the infected cells. Now this of course reduces the lag time between detection That's of the B. antigen and elimination the shows B. selective findings from a comparative analysis of student drug use in various Caribbean countries. And here we have the average age of the first use of alcohol by gender. And uh, in my opinion, uh, well, I'm not a, a drinker at all, really, but this is really young for some of these, some of these countries. Uh, Trinidad is, is 10 years old, close to 11 years old for both, both male and female. I'm assuming that this is when they just take a little sip of beer. I, I don't know. This, this is very young. But... Part one, compare the overall average age of first use of alcohol by males with the overall average age of first use of females across the region. Quote the overall mean values in your comparison. Well, basically, if you were to find the sum of all these numbers and divide it by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, for the males, you would get 11.4. And same thing with the females, they will be slightly older, which would be 11.7. Add all the numbers and divide it by the number of countries that are being accounted for. So therefore, the overall age of males using alcohol for the first time was slightly lower than that for females. There's only a marginal difference in this case. Part 2, giving a brief explanation, suggests two major social consequences of adolescent abuse of alcohol in the Caribbean, basically teenage drinking. Um, so I've given three here. I remember we had to focus on major. So one, alcohol dependence and potential organ damage can occur. So for example, liver cirrhosis. Um, so if it starts very early on teenage years, dependency can occur very quickly and can persist into the adult years and you know in the early adult years people can suffer from scarring of the liver or fatty liver syndrome and so on because those that those ethanol particles um get absorbed by the liver some of them convert or prevent the um degradation of fatty acids or little fatty acids get stored in the organs two alcohol abuse can potentially lead to violence and crime due to reduced inhibition. This could also, you could, another example could be fighting in schools. And three, alcohol abuse may lead to declining grades and school absenteeism, which would of course have a detrimental effect 
on the student's education and prospects in the future. All right, so let's look at four. And this is a glycolysis question, it's six marks. So we want to be detailed with the steps. So they say with reference to key steps, explain how the net production of high energy compounds is achieved in glycolysis. So something that we have to note here is that glycolysis actually produces four ATP at the end. However, it takes two ATP to start the process. So in the end, there's only two net ATP molecules that are produced. There are also, through glycolysis, two NADH molecules or compounds that are produced. Just to briefly explain what is NADH. NADH is a reduced form of a compound called NAD. And what can happen is, I always say to describe it as a catcher's mitt. NADH is like a catcher's mitt hole in a ball of hydrogen or hydrogen ion and it can toss out that hydrogen ion to release energy or to cause certain reactions to occur. For example, in the electron transport chain. But in glycolysis, this is what's going to happen here. So glucose, which is a six carbon compound, is going to be phosphorylated. So phosphorylated means phosphates are going to be added to it. So what we need to do is convert glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. And this uses 1 ATP. So this is basically a glucose with one phosphate group at the end. Now, glucose 6-phosphate is going to be isomerized, think of it as rearranged, to form fructose 6-phosphate. And that is then phosphorylated again to form fructose biphosphate. And of course, biphosphate here indicates that it has two phosphate groups. So this also uses one ATP. So this is where this would use two ATP to sort of kickstart the whole process. It would turn glucose and add two phosphate groups to it to turn it into fructose biphosphate. Now, why do we need to do that? Now, this is because fructose biphosphate is a bit unstable. And it is usually broken down or split to form two molecules of triose phosphate. And triose phosphate is a three carbon compound with a phosphate group added to the end. So it forms two molecules of this. These triose phosphates are phosphorylated. And these form two NADH from NAD. And two molecules of ATP are formed when those phosphate groups are then released so that ADP can be converted to ATP. So ADP is phosphorylated during the conversion of the triose phosphate to pyruvate. Now remember there were two triose phosphates, so this occurs twice and this would form four ATP. But there would only be two net ATP in the end because it took two ATP to start the process, which have been here and here, to turn glucose into fructose biphosphate. So out of this four ATP, only a net gain of two occurred. Let's look at B1. Discuss two environmental benefits of maintaining biodiversity. Include a definition of biodiversity in our discussion. Well, biodiversity is defined as the variation among members of species, populations, and ecosystems. So, for example, if you have a forest that is next to a swamp, and you would have many different species of birds and frogs and snails and fish and insects and plants in there, but you could also have multiple Microecosystems in there, like puddles, um, logs with insects in them, even the trees can have multiple flora and fauna in them. Now, this also accounts for genetic variation because the birds and the frogs could all could be of the same species, but be quite genetically different from each other. And this, of course, leads to them having more vigor, more genetic vigor. So two benefits of maintaining biodiversity. So I have three here. 
One is that it facilitates ecosystem stability due to complex food webs, especially pollinators, which is um, tantamount to plant growth. Crops, biological controls of pests, especially for invasive species, and a variety of food sources for consumers. So, for example, if one uh, species migrates, the consumers may have um, other food sources to choose from. Two, having a high tree species diversity can store many carbon compounds um, after photosynthesis. So, for example, sugars that are photosynthesized. And this leads to climate stabilization because it reduces the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And three, reduce destruction caused by natural disasters. So, for example, if there's large numbers of mangroves in a swamp, this would reduce coastal erosion and damage through uh, storms and typhoons and so on. Part two, giving examples distinguished between in situ and ex situ conservation methods. This literally in situ means on site and ex situ means off site. So in situ, wow, I put conversation here. Let's change that to conservation consists of measures applied to the habitats where organisms live. So basically you're doing the conservation on site. You're not taking the organisms out. You want to leave them in a natural habitat. So examples would be national parks. So for example, the Serengeti, uh, protected reserves and pollution prevention or mitigation so that um, there could be as little human intervention as possible. Other examples of this could be um, moratoriums for hunting, um, banning poaching in the areas. All of those would be on-site con conservation or in situ. Ex situ, however, is where the natural habitat may be a little too dangerous and some organisms may be removed and may be kept in man-made enclosements or they may be kept in um, botanic gardens or zoos, or they may store the genetic material in seed banks or embryo banks. And those would be off-site conservation or ex situ. Let's look at question 5a. Define the term hormone and with reference to insulin and glucagon. Explain how hormones function in the coordination of activities in mammals. First, to define a hormone, a hormone is a molecule or compound that is made in the body, released by endocrine glands into the bloodstream, and it targets cells or tissues to produce a specific response. A good example of this would be ADH, because ADH targets cells in the collecting duct of the kidney to facilitate or increase the reabsorption of water to open aquaporin proteins to allow water to flow back into the bloodstream. So what we're concentrating here on is insulin and glucagon. Insulin is released when blood glucose level is too high, so when it increases beyond a set point, basically beyond what would be considered the normal range for that body. The islets of Langerhans in the pancreas signal for beta cells to secrete more insulin. What insulin does is that it targets the cells and allows uptake of glucose from the blood. How it does that is that it uh, activates this GLUT4 protein in the cell, which basically takes or transports vesicles to the cell membrane and allows those glucose to enter through those GLUT4 proteins. Glucagon is kind of the opposite of insulin. Glucagon is released if the blood glucose level is too low or decreases beyond the set point. And the alpha cells in the pancreas detect the change and facilitate glucagon secretion. So what this does is that while insulin converts glucose or helps with the conversion of glucose into glycogen, glycogen is the stored form of glucose, glucagon facilitates um, the conversion of glycogen or breaks down glycogen to form glucose, the opposite. 
what glucagon could also do is to synthesize glucose from amino acids this would be um, for people who are on ketogenic diets and most of what they're consuming are proteins and fats and very very little carbohydrates so they can actually synthesize glucose from those proteins and fats that is called gluconeogenesis let's look at b myasthenia gravis or ms is an autoimmune disease in which the body's antibodies block and destroy the neurotransmitter receptors at neuromuscular junctions explain the term neuromuscular junction and using your knowledge of synaptic transmission explain why ms results in progressive weakening of the skeletal muscles those would be like biceps and triceps for example we don't need the full sequence of events in synaptic transmission okay so first of all a neuromuscular junction is the synapse between a motor neuron and a muscle cell motor neurons of course connect the muscle cells connect the spine the well the spinal cord or the interneurons to the muscle cells um a little a little background about this here basically what happens in the neuron is that an action potential will get to the presynaptic bulb of the neuron and there will be a gap between what is called the presynaptic bulb and the postsynaptic membrane of the neuron. That gap there is, that, there's a number of reasons why that gap is there, but think of it as it is there to regulate or limit the transmission of action potentials through neurons so that they don't keep firing constantly. So what is released into that gap is a chemical called a neurotransmitter, in this case here, acetylcholine. When that actual potential reaches the presynaptic membrane, it opens sodium channels or calcium channels to cause a change in polarization. And what that does is that stimulates the release of acetylcholine through vesicles. Now, this acetylcholine would usually bind to receptor proteins on the successive neuron or the postsynaptic membrane. Now, if the receptor proteins are destroyed, the receptors are destroyed, the acetylcholine would be released, but there would be nothing for it to bind to. Now, typically when the acetylcholine binds to the receptors, it allows the opening of channels on the postsynaptic membrane. So, the action potential or the electrical impulse can continue to the other membrane. In the case here, if the receptors are destroyed, it's kind of like you are breaking a circuit. So action potentials cannot be generated and thus the muscle receives no stimulus to contract. So in that electrical impulse or action potential, there will be the message to either contract or relax the muscle. Now when a muscle is not used, the muscle becomes weak. This is called atrophy. So muscular weakness will occur over time due to lack of use. So basically, the action potential can still be released. The neurotransmitter will still be released, but there's nothing for the neurotransmitter to bind to. So the action potential cannot continue or jump to the following neuron. So it breaks the circuit. As a result, the muscle cannot contract. Let's look at question 6a. Explain the mechanism by which the dengue fever virus multiplies within the body and the mode of transmission from person to person. Comment on how this knowledge can allow us to better prevent the transmission of the disease. Well, we know that female mosquitoes, what they do is that they feed on blood. And what can happen is that when they feed on the blood of an infected person, the dengue virus can enter their abdomen through, you know, when they inject the saliva. They take up the virus into their abdomen and then they can deposit it onto an uninfected person. So what happens once the virus reaches inside the person? Well, the virus attaches to a human cell via the cell membrane receptors. On the outside of the virus, there are smaller proteins that act like keys. So the virus enters the cell via endocytosis.
and it breaks down to release RNA into the cytoplasm. This viral RNA uses the apparatus of the cell, uses the cell's rough endoplasmic reticulum and the ribosomes to make new virus components. Typically what the ER and the ribosomes do is that they make proteins, but the virus is using them to make new viruses. So this new viral RNA Right, the genetic material is being assembled and all the parts are being assembled, including the little spike proteins, um, the little capsid. These are being assembled and transferred to the Golgi body to be packaged into vesicles. So the virus is using the cell to basically make more versions of itself. The vesicles leave the cell via exocytosis, carrying the newly assembled viruses. And this is exactly how it gets its phospholipid coat when it breaks off the cell membrane. So the virus circulates in the blood where it is picked up by female mosquitoes when they feed on that blood. So the mosquito would then have the virus in their abdomen and on their mouth parts of proboscis. So the, mouth, the mosquito feeds on the uninfected person transmitting the virus to them via the saliva on the mouth parts. Of course, to prevent transmission, we need to minimize the population of mosquitoes in the first place. So any breeding grounds, for example, stagnant water sources or tires that contain water or contain uncovered containers that contain water can be removed. If there's a pond nearby, maybe some fish can be introduced to eat the larvae. Adult mosquitoes can also be killed by insecticides or pesticides when um, the government or neighborhoods can enact spring programs. Part B. Discuss the social and economic impacts of AIDS in the Caribbean region. So first of all, to explain what is AIDS, AIDS stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. And this typically occurs when the T lymphocyte or white blood cell level drops below a certain point where the immune system becomes severely compromised. This is caused by a virus HIV, stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. It is usually transmitted via raw sexual contact or exchange of uh, sexual fluids like semen or vaginal fluids or blood transfusions. The Caribbean region has a very high rate of infection. So what are the impacts of this? Well, one, stigma and alienation of patients with HIV or AIDS can reduce contributions of these members to society. So for example, if some people have AIDS, they might have um, employers who might discriminate and prevent them from being employed in the first place, or co-workers who don't want to work with them. Two, if many young persons become debilitated or very ill from HIV or AIDS, and typically the people who get it are within the 20 to 30 age range, which is basically some of your most productive years. Well, this can be detrimental to the labor force as well as their families or children, especially since many of the children will be very young and families would be very new. Tre treatment drugs, for example, AZT, are expensive and in the Caribbean typically um, difficult to obtain. And if they do obtain it, they have to take it for the rest of their life. Funds needed for testing and diagnosis may also place a strain on the country's economy. Lastly, the economy may be affected if tourism is affected due to HIV or AIDS stigma. I don't think we've gotten to that point yet, but um, it has affected some sub-Saharan countries in Africa. Um, for example, a good example is Swaziland, where, or Eswatini, it's called nowadays, where the AIDS prevalence is very, very high. And this is seven marks, so you're going to have three of these points here well explained. And just a note to say that the Caribbean has a high rate of infection. And that's it. That is this paper. You'll take care later.